by the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. God, great is your faithfulness to us. Hallelujah. Just a little tag we want to sing, everybody. Sing who? Who? Can you catch this and help us sing? Who? If God has been faithful to you, come on, sing it. Who? One more. Sing who? family and friends. Welcome to Second Chance Sunday. This morning the Repidee Ministry is honored to share this opportunity with you to raise awareness of some of the obstacles and challenges facing our formerly incarcerated brothers and sisters as they return home 
to their families and communities. We believe that everyone deserves a second chance to begin again. And as we think of God's goodness and presence in our lives, we are humbled by the gift of His grace and humbled by His unconditional invitation to begin again. The Rufferdeen Ministry at First Baptist, led by our pastor, Reverend Rashad Raymond Moore, is committed to being that beacon of hope and that opportunity that our returning citizens and their friends and family can rely upon. First Baptist, you can help. Erasing the stigma, shame and guilt associated with incarceration will begin to diminish as we welcome returning citizens home to their communities. The Rufferdeen Ministry is a safe and private environment for the re returning citizens and formerly incarcerated families and friends to seek help. We are here to assist and support in every way in their journey to a successful transition. The ministry provides referrals to job training, temporary uh, financial assistance, substance abuse, and mental health assistance. Please reach out. We are here to help. This is Second Chance Sunday. We know what God requires of us, that we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. We gather this morning to remind each other about that and to remember that now is the right time to always do these things. We are reminded of his goodness and his call for us to be a part of that goodness. God offers new life, a fresh start, and a second chance to begin again. So welcome family, friends, visitor and honored guest. It is a good day to worship and praise God. He is in our midst. You are here. You are here. Thank you for being here today. While you're here. morning first baptist family and friends this is the day that the lord has made and we will rejoice let us rejoice and be glad in it i am so glad that you have joined us once again on a sunday morning here at the first baptist church of crown heights today we continue our celebration of the resurrection by honoring and celebrating the work of our Rephidim ministry. The Rephidim ministry here at the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights is dedicated to supporting brothers and sisters who are returning home from incarceration. We believe that all of God's children have humanity and dignity, even those who have spent time in prison. So today we break the stigma. Today we make our presence known, our love known to all of our loved ones 
who are incarcerated, and we ask God to strengthen us that we may continue the work of building the beloved community here on earth as it is in heaven. I'm excited this morning because we have one of our good friends, a great preacher of the gospel, the Reverend Dr. Darren Ferguson, pastor of the Bethel Baptist Church, who will bring us the word of God. So I want you to open up your heart. I want you to open up your mind. I want you to ask the Lord to come into your home and bring that presence that gives us strength. Here at First Baptist, we believe that we enter to worship. That's how we find strength. And then we depart to serve. We go Go out of these doors to proclaim the message to the world that there is still one who can save and break all chains. And that is the power of Jesus Christ. So let us join our hearts this morning in worship. Let us pray together. Let us sing together. Let us shout with the preacher and let us get our hands ready to do the work of the resurrection that God has called us to do from our corner of the world. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Let us center our hearts for prayer. Come on, gather your family together. Let's center our hearts for prayer. Eternal God, we come to you this morning on this great Sunday morning. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of life and for life itself. We thank you, O oh God, that after a long week of working, after a long week of doctor's appointments, after a long week of ups and downs, we pause on this Sunday morning because we know that all of our strength, all of our hope comes from you. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So God, we ask now that you would renew our strength, that you would give us the strength to mount up our wings like eagles, that you would give us the strength to run and not be weary. We ask now, oh God, that you would have your way in this hour, oh God, speak to our hearts. Give us clarity of thought, give us clarity of speech. Speak to our hearts, oh God. Give us peace that surpasses all understanding. And when this moment is over, oh God, give us the strength to run on, to continue to proclaim the good news to the world. And as we go forth in worship, let us say together, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. This is our prayer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our congregational hymn of the morning, old song, there's a bright side somewhere. I want you to sing that song with our minister of music this morning and let us look to the hills from the one who gives us all of our help and all of our hope. Let us sing now to the power of God. Seems 
Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. Bread of heaven. Till I want no more. Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up and make me whole. Here's my cup. Fill it up and make. my cup, fill it up and make me whole. And God, this is our heart's desire. We ask for more of you, oh God. Song says, I need more, 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 Jesus more. You alone. 
alone sing. You alone are my heart's desire and I long Come on to worship. To worship. I want to declare that one more time. Everybody, you alone are my strength. Hey. Sing and and I long, and I long to worship, to worship me. Yeah. Last time and I long to worship me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. now prayer time in the life of our church. I want you, wherever you are, to pause for a moment just to still the noise of the world. And I want you to seek the face of God this morning. I want you to pray for members of our congregation who are standing in the need of prayer. In this moment, you will see a listing of names on your screen of men and women, brothers and sisters who are asking that you would remember them in your prayers. You may not know all that's going on in their lives, but I want you to remember them in your prayers. This week, I had a chance to talk to Sister Lorraine Dozier, who was leaving to go south to remember two of her nephews who both died just a day apart. So I want you to pray for that entire family. Pray for Sister Dozier's sister, who will have to bury two sons this week. This week, I had a chance to talk to Sister Mildred Smith, who is currently hospitalized in Methodist Hospital. I want you to remember her in your prayers as well. I want you to remember Sister Yolanda Danforth in your prayers. She's asking for the prayers of the church. We prayed for her daughter a couple of months ago, Anaya Danforth, who was going through uh, treatment for a kidney. Well, she, her kidney transplant went very, very well, and I had a chance to meet Anaya Danforth for the first time during our Palm Sunday swing by. Anaya Danforth joined the church last week, and we want to welcome her to our fellowship. There's so much to pray for this morning, beloved. Even though we're not able to come to the altar, all of our burdens are here at the altar. I want you to lift each other up in prayer. Take some time this week. If you see a name on the screen, Take some time to call them this week just to let them know that you are praying for them. And on this Second Chance Sunday, you know, we talk about the sick, we talk about the bereaved, we talk about those who are having, you know, stress in life, but rarely do we ever talk about the families who have loved ones who are incarcerated. There are members of our congregation. Everybody in this congregation knows somebody who was incarcerated. I want you to pray for those families. And I want you to pray for our brothers and sisters this morning who have names. Some of them are your sons and daughters. Some of them are your cousins and your nephews. Let us pray for them this morning as we continue to ask God to give us the strength to bring justice, to bring all of our brothers and sisters home. So let us pray. Eternal God, we come to you this morning. And first, before we ask for anything, we just first of all want to just say thank you Thank you, thank you, O oh God, for the gift of rising again. There were so many, O oh God, who went to sleep this week who did not wake up. And, and we don't take it lightly that you've allowed our days to roll on just a little bit longer. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of a new day's journey. 
So we ask now, O oh God, that you would continue to walk with us and talk with us each step of the way until we are all that you have called us to be. God, we have a list of names before us this morning of members of our congregation who are standing in the need of prayer. And God, we all go through moments of life when it just seems like it's just too much for us to bear. But somewhere I read you would never put more honor on us than we can bear. So we ask now, oh God, that you would give us the strength to bear up these wings, oh God, through your power. We ask now, oh God, that you would touch the family of Lorraine Dozier in all of our families that are sick and bereaved this morning. We, we pray for the Gibbs family. Last week they buried a brother and this week they're now burying a cousin because of COVID-19. COVID, y'all, is still a reality. I know you're vaccinated, but ask God to give you wisdom and strength because we've got to take it slowly as we come into this reopening phase. We ask now, oh God, that you, you would touch every family that is sick this morning. There's, there's someone under the sound of my voice, oh God, that's sitting in a waiting room in a hospital, waiting, oh God, to hear the diagnosis from the doctor. We ask now, oh God, that you would strengthen every family that's caring for loved ones who are sick and who are ill. We ask now, oh God, even on this Second Chance Sunday, that we pause to remember those who are incarcerated. God, they're not a number. They're not just a social security number, but they, are, they have names, oh God. They're our sons. They are our daughters. They're our brothers. They are our sisters. They're our friends. They are our neighbors. And they mean something to us, oh God but they also mean something to you. So we ask now, oh God, that you would give them a second chance. God, I'm, I'm praying this morning for someone who is behind prison bars that I know. I don't got to call them by name, but I want you to go into that prison cell and let them know, oh God, that the resurrection is still possible for them, that there's never, it's never too late, oh God, to begin again. It's never too late to be transformed. It's never too late again, oh God, to start walking right. So we ask now, that you would give them the power, oh God, to change their mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what this Sunday is about. It reminds each and every one of us that we are sinners who have been saved by your grace. You have given us, oh God, the gift of a second chance. You've given us, oh God, the gift of a do-over. So we ask now, oh God, that you would give us strength. We're getting ready to come back to church, but we're not coming back to what we're left. We're coming back and we're beginning again. So that means that as we come back, oh God, we've got to put a more a priority, oh God, in helping those who are coming home from incarceration. We thank you. We thank you, oh God, for the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's by this ministry that we have been saved but it is also by this ministry that we have been called into greater service. So establish the work of our hands, oh God, that every phone call we make to the prison, may it bring good news. Every letter that we write, may it bring hope. Every letter that we write of support, may it touch the heart of the judge. Everything that we do, oh God, is for your glory. So we ask that whatever you do in this season, please, oh God, don't do it without us. We are your hands and your feet, and we are ready to make a difference. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the people of God, right where you are, said amen, amen, and amen. Hello, First Baptist family. April is National Second Chance Month, and I'd like to say a few words about my own reentry. As some of you may know, I joined First Baptist just a few days after being released from prison for nearly 15 years. Initially, it was my relationship with Reverend Bloodsaw which brought me to the church, but it was a genuine embrace and acceptance I felt from many of you which kept me coming back. 
It was a very difficult time in my reentry, and I found myself faced with some really hard parole conditions, which forced me to live in a men's shelter way out on the edge of Queens near Long Island. I had to take a bus to a train to a bus just to get to the church, but it was always worth it. And I always walked away with a word, not only from pastor, but from many of you. But it wasn't just your words, but also your actions, which encouraged, motivated, and helped me push through the most difficult phase of reentry. And as time went on and I found myself working two jobs seven days a week, I would still take that long trip in the First Baptist, even if it meant I had to run out at the end of service just to be in time for a 10 hour shift. Because you were pouring into me everything that I needed. But it wasn't just out of need that I came to First Baptist. Because even after I moved out of that men's shelter to my own place, I still came. Even after those two jobs turned into one job, and that one job turned into a better job, and that one to an even better job, I'm still here. Because First Baptist is my family, and I want to thank you all for being a blessing in my life. Greetings, First Baptist family. And thank you, Pastor Moore, for making this reentry Sunday a powerful reality. You may know me from the community as a Crown Heights resident. I also just retired from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. You may have known my father, the late Congressman Major Owens, whose homegoing service was held right here at First Baptist. My role today, however, is to share some points about reentry, the process of giving someone a second chance in our community. First, reentry is an opportunity for good public policy. A caring culture means the development of appropriate, affordable housing, hassle-free education and training opportunities, ending discrimination in hiring, providing counseling and family support tools, and much more. Reentry programs exist to assist individuals with their identified needs. We may think we know what someone needs, but whether or not we are correct, the individual has to acknowledge the need as well. And usually, folks coming home have many more needs than you or I can recognize. One of those needs is the need for family support. In other words, we cannot and should not be ashamed to acknowledge that someone in our family may have been incarcerated or may be incarcerated. That is why this ministry was created by First Baptist in association with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Today, District Attorney Eric Gonzalez is as supportive of our efforts as the late DA Ken Thompson was. The Reentry Bureau at the District Attorney's Office is available to all who need help. My second point is that reentry is an opportunity for the entire community to engage in healing, starting with us. Thousands of individuals who reside in Brooklyn interact with the criminal justice system every day in one form or another. Individuals and families are hurt every day by the actions of a few, and we have to deal with that pain. At least 2,500 people return to Brooklyn communities each year from incarceration at the federal, state, or city level. Brooklyn congregations can educate ourselves about reentry issues, as well as the criminal justice system as a whole. We can be better prepared to embrace our prodigal sons and daughters. We don't have to start by killing the fatted calf. We can work up to that. We can start with simply being loving. And that brings me to my third point. Reentry is an opportunity for the formerly incarcerated individual to become a community contributor. The individual who feels isolated and alone can make her or his new commitment to family, friends, and neighbors through actions, however small. No matter how much we love, building trust takes time and effort. That is why healing is a very important component, healing as a community. Opportunities to build this trust must be provided by the community. Here at First Baptist, we have the Rephidim Ministry, and we encourage everyone to check us out. One day, we will see such ministries in every church, in every synagogue, in every mosque, in Brooklyn and beyond. Thank you. Remember to love your brother and sister. Remember that reentry matters. Remember to check out the Rephidim Ministry. Thank you for allowing me this time. We want to take this opportunity to show some love to all of our April babies. Whether you're turning 12, 52, 92, every birthday is a blessing. So on behalf of our congregation, we wish you God's richest blessings on another year of becoming.
happy birthday. We wish you a very happy birthday. Come on, here we go. Say happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Here we go. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Come on, say that one more time. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. First Baptist, this morning, I am so honored to welcome to our pulpit a great friend of our church and one who I consider to be a big brother in ministry, and that is the Bishop, Reverend Dr. Darren Ferguson, a.k.a. Ferg. I met Reverend Ferguson when I was at Abyssinian. He also is a son of Abyssinian, and he has been affectionately known by so many simply as Ferg. He is one who I have encountered in the pulpit, one who has taught me in the seminary, one who I have met in the courtroom advocating for families. He is one who is on the ground. He is just real. He's about that business. That's who he is. And so today, on this Sunday, I can't think of a better preacher who will come to prick our hearts, but also to inspire us to do greater work than the Reverend Dr. Darren Ferguson. He is the pastor of Bethel Baptist Church in Orange, New Jersey, and is now doing great work with the mayor's office on their re-entry force as well. He is one, I can't say anything else. He is just full of love. He is one who is just filled with hope, and I know that he's also filled with the power of God. So now, I just want you to put in the chat, God bless Bishop Ferguson as he comes to bring us the word today. So following our choir of the morning, the next voice you will hear will be that of none other than Bishop Reverend Dr. Darren Ferguson, pastor of the Bethel Baptist Church of Orange, New Jersey. And as they used to say, hear ye him. One, two, ready, and. I would be lost like a ship
of Crown Heights. God bless you. I am so glad to be with you all this morning. I want to give honor and praise to God first and foremost, and also a great thank you to your great pastor, my brother, Pastor Raymond Rashad Moore. I'm so glad to be with you on this day where you celebrate and you observe reentry and all of the great work that you guys are going to continue to do in your community that will reverberate around the state and around the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I am Bishop Darren Ferguson, pastor of Bethel Baptist Church in uh, Orange, New Jersey, and it is my honor and privilege to be with you this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to a very familiar passage of scripture, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 17th first. The 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 17th verse, and it reads as follows. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Second Corinthians is a fascinating look into the heart and soul of the Apostle Paul. He is in this intensely personal letter defending his apostolic authority. He expounds upon 
his conduct during physical challenges, and even responds to persecution from those who wanted to legalize the faith. Paul has to defend himself, but there are many who would like to challenge his authority, pointing to the fact that he had once been a Pharisee, a persecutor of the faith, and one who led the followers of the way off, chains. His political enemies, if you will, were accusing him of not being who he claimed to be. They said he was not truly called by God. They said there was absolutely no way that God could possibly have called someone who persecuted Christians to be the focal point of developing Christian thought, the Christian church, and the Christian faith. After all, how could God reach so far down in the gutter when there are those of us who have followed the Lord so faithfully for all these years, both when he was alive and now that he's gone? Paul takes all of this into account when writing this second letter to the church at Corinth. He takes time out in this scripture passage to show that God's transforming power can change anyone. That God's transforming power can change anyone, anytime, and in any place. When we get to chapter 5, Paul is making the most emphatic statement possible when it comes to his apostolic authority question that people were asking was how can such a man as Paul be an apostle of the Lord's church? How can a persecutor of the faith transform into a defender and proclaimer of the same? How can a man who hated Christians aspire to be chief amongst them? Paul answers all of this with our scripture of any of, of, of emphasis. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I know I read the NIV, but I quoted the King James Version. But watch this. Paul was saying that with a life, a heart, and a mind renewed by Christ, that anyone can and will change, no matter who you used to be, no matter what you used to be, no matter what you used to do. The thought that I would like to leave with you today, First Baptist, is... Shift happens. Shift happens. Paul had experienced a shift in his life. The spirit of the Lord was activated in Paul's life, as we read in the book of Acts. It caused a shift in his life, with, which changed him from being a persecutor to being a proclaimer. It changed him from being a killer to being a kinsman. It changed him from being a jailer to a deliverer, and from a Pharisee to a follower. I need you to understand, beloved, that when God enters the picture, shift is always going to happen. When Jesus comes into the equation, the situation always shifts from whatever it was to whatever God wants it to be. Family, I need you to know that when God comes in, shift is going to happen. What we need to be concerned with is that the shift is from sinner to saint, from hard knocks to holiness, and from the guttermost to the uttermost. What does it mean to shift? It, it seems simple enough, but I found that when you look in the dictionary, sometimes you find things in everyday words that are more than meets the eye. So I looked up the word shift in my trusty dusty, my trusty dusty dictionary. Yes, I did. And, and, and my American Heritage Dictionary informed me that the word shift means to exchange one thing for another. It also means to move or transfer from one place or position to another. It also means to change direction. I, I need you to know this morning that I have been a beneficiary of the shift. I need you to know that there are many men and women who you see walking amongst you every day that are beneficiaries of the shift. And I need you to understand that all of us need to shift. It needs to happen for a lot of us in three ways. First thing is we need to exchange some things in our lives for some other things that need to be in our lives. Second, we may need to change place or position. And finally, we need to change our direction. Now, there's some things that we need to exchange in our lives, right? There, there, I mean, you know, uh, some of us receive gifts uh, for birthdays and for holidays that we don't want. Uh, they don't we don't need them, they don't fit, and, and we don't hesitate to take them back. We don't hesitate to exchange them. 
we don't hesitate to get rid of them. I submit to you today that we must exchange some things in our lives for some better things that could be in our lives. And since this is reentry day, let me keep it on the point at hand. We need to exchange the idea that people can't change to the notion that God can change anything. I, I stand here knowing that, that God truly saves in the darkest places. I, I'm standing here letting you know that there was a time when I exchanged the, the life that I had, the life that I had, 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 had fallen into, the life that I had through my own bad decisions created for myself. And God created a shift. I was able to exchange the pain and the drug addiction and the incarceration of my past for, for what God had ahead of me, which was becoming an educated man, becoming a better father, becoming a better husband, becoming what God intended for me to be. And I need you to understand that this shift, this exchange, is not only happening in the pews of our churches. This shift and exchange is also happening behind the walls of our prisons each and every day. Now, some of us also need to shift our position, don't we? When you're sitting on your couch, and you find yourself not comfortable, especially when you get to my age and that stuff start hurting, you shift your position so you can relax. Some of us are constantly shifting position in our sleep so that we can sleep peacefully. All right? But I need you to know that many of us need to shift our mindset as well. Our mindset has become uncomfortable. The mindset that we as black people cannot accept those who have at one point damaged our community, at one point committed crimes. And we need to shift our positions from thinking that those people are, are, are not worthy of redemption, that those individuals who have been in prison are not capable of turning their lives around because some of us need to say that we need to shift our position because we know that there before the grace of God we go. Some of us are, were only a slippery highway away from a, 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 a jail sentence ourselves. Some of us are, are sitting there thinking right now about things that you did that you're glad nobody knows about because you, you're not sure if the statute of limitations ran out. That shifting of position creates for us as a community a comfortable space where everybody can walk through the doors of our churches, where everybody can walk down the streets of our community and know that there's opportunity for them, there's love for them, there's redemption for them. And I'm so grateful and so blessed to know that, that the good folks of First Baptist are ready to shift the position of the community, the long-standing position of the community, that and, and begin to welcome folks back into the fold. Because guess what? I need you to understand that part of the reason that my position shifted is because folks like you loved on me when there was no future. We're so concerned with everything else. People are going to think that sometimes we find ourselves doing nothing. So I submit to you that sometimes we just got to upset the apple cart. Sometimes we just have to break some eggs. Sometimes we just got to squeeze some lemon. And what will happen in that squeezing, in that breaking, and in that shifting, we'll find that we have a brighter community. We have a more well-rounded community. That we will have people who are coming back into our communities, who are credible messengers, who can help our young people turn their lives around. And all it takes on our part is a slight shift. And then finally, we have to shift our direction. You can't stay on the same highway and expect to get to a different destination. You can't keep driving north when you want to go south. You can't keep studying medicine and expect to be a lawyer. You can't keep acting like a fool if you expect to be treated like a wise man. Or a wise man. What do you mean, preacher? I mean that in terms of our ideas and our thoughts about formerly incarcerated, we need to go from depressed to elated. We need to go from sick to healthy. We need to go from ornery to amiable. We need to go from nasty to nice. We need to go from stressed to blessed. We need to go from overwhelmed to overjoyed. We need to go from pugilistic to peaceful, from enigmatic to energetic, from gossiper to God-fearing, from demonic to sermonic, and from persecuted to persevering. 
from fear to faith, from embattled to enlightened, and from a hater to a participator, and from the guttermost to the uttermost. We need a shift. We need a shift in our mindset. We need, and, and look, I know it's not everybody. I know there's some of y'all sitting there thinking about the people in your family. I know there's some folks sitting there thinking about people you know who are incarcerated. You don't treat them like that. I don't think like that, but let me help. I remember sitting in the visiting room and Sing Sing once. And my family came to visit me. My dad was a former retired police officer. Wife, daughter, who was a baby then. <clears throat> and one of the things that they asked me was they would see me saying hi to different guys. I said, I so crushing it. I remember my, my, my dad asking me, what's he in for? And looking at another person said, what's he in for? And I realized that they were judging me as son, husband, father. They were judging everybody else as an outline, criminal. That family is where we need to shift. That family is where we need to change our mindset. You see, the people in our families, we are safe with them, we know them, we understand them. But the other person outside the family, and I can tell you right now, some of those same men that my family were looking, giving them the side eye, some of these guys are working in the halls of politics. Some of these men are preachers and pastors in their own right. Some of these men are are doing great work in our community for young people. Some of them are working in higher education. Some of them are working uh, all over the country in pharmaceutical companies. There, there are some of them who are just going about their everyday duties of being fathers and husbands and what God called them to be. And and that doesn't just stop there. I, I, I was volunteering going up to one of the women's prisons in New York a couple of years ago, and I'm seeing these sisters come home. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about my, my, my sister Donna Hilton, who's come home and, and wrote a book called A Little Piece of Light after doing 20-something odd years in prison. I'm thinking about all of these men and women who, who were the outcasts of society, who, who, who folks looked at uh, askance and thought that their crimes were horrible and thought that their crimes were heinous and thought that they were beyond redemption. But God caused the shift. See, when, when, when Christ came in, and, and not all of them are Christians, but all of them are enlightened by the love of the Lord. All of them love the Lord. Maybe they don't go to church every Sunday, but I can tell you that there was a... a a, a, a God reckoning that happened with each and every one of us and now we have changed we have shifted and I can tell you right now that I don't care what you've done in your life I don't care what crime you've committed I don't care what offense you've committed I don't care how embarrassed you are about the things in your dark past that you never want to come to light I want you to know that when God comes into the equation when 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 when, when the Lord shines his light upon you, that's when we say that all things have become new. I, I can tell you as personally, I have a new life. I have a new way of thinking. Who would have thought that the same guy that was convicted of attempted murder in the second degree back in 1991 would now be working for the police department in Orange, New Jersey? Who would have thought that the same guy who was sniffing coke and, and drinking beer on the streets of Harlem back in the late 80s and early 90s uh, is the same guy who be standing here preaching to the great First Baptist Church who would have served as youth minister at Abyssinian Baptist Church. And I need you to understand that I did not get to this place all by myself. The shift happened, first of all, because God is good and God is good all the time. Because God shined his light on me. Because God never turned his back on me. Because God welcomed me with open arms. But it also happened because there were so many folks in my life who did not give up on me. There was so many folks who looked beyond my crime and saw the person that I am. There were so many people who looked beyond the things that I committed and looked at my current commitment and I need you to have that same open mind to have that same mindset that we can redeem our community there is no man there is no woman who is beyond redemption there is no child that is beyond redemption there's no community that's beyond redemption and when you stand on the word of God when you stand on God's promises when you know that 
if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are passed away and all things become new. That is when shift happens in your life. So church, I want you to prepare for the shift. I want you to lift up your hands, throw back your head and open up your mouth and know that God is about to shift something in First Baptist Church. Know that God is about to shift something in your personal situation. Know that God is going to shift something in the lives of men and women who are returning from prison. All we have to do is be in Christ. That means that we got to be in it to win it. It means that we can't be a, a, a an observer. We have to be a participator. It means that God is saying to us right now that when we step into Christ, when we make that commitment, when we say, I give my all to you, when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, that's where the shift happens. I don't know about you, but even at this point in my life, even at 57 years old and 23 years removed from the prison system, I still need shift in my life. I, knew, I still need God's power. I still need to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit to shift things in my life, to shift shift me from where I am to where God desires me to be. So I want to leave you with this family as I come to a close. The songwriter simply said this, I was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despair and cry from the waters lifted me now safe am i the shift happened because love lifted me because love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me souls in danger look above my lord completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs faithful love and service to ever to him belongs because love lifted me love will lift you love will cause shift to happen because god is mighty to bring down strongholds allow the shift to happen in your life you know that god is with us even to the end of the age God bless you, family. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Amen. Beloved, the doors of our church are open. We would love for First Baptist Church of Crown Heights to become your church home. If you are living in the New York City area and you don't have a church home, we would love for you to consider making First Baptist a part of your family, a part of your journey of faith formation with Christ. We are a 67-year-old congregator in Brooklyn that loves God, that loves God's people, that loves to worship, that loves to serve. Right here from this corner, we have raised children. Right here from this corner, we have lifted families. Right here from this corner, we have changed lives through the preaching of the gospel. Our ministries range from youth all the way up to seniors. Our ministries range from music all the way to service. There is a place for each and every one of you here at the First Baptist Church. Make this friendly church on the hill your church home. You may go over to our website at myfbcch.com. We would love to start the conversation today. When I think about the
Baptist, I'm so glad that you joined us for worship again this Sunday morning, and I pray that you were blessed by our time together. Let us thank Bishop Ferguson for a mighty word today. We thank God for him stopping by our pulpit, and we look forward to fellowshipping with Bishop Ferguson in the days to come in person. Let us keep the faith. Let us stay strong. Let us stay connected until we gather again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and throughout our tomorrows. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. God bless you. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon. Anybody feel like having some church this morning? We've come to remind you that there's nobody like Jesus. Come on, just put your hands together.